was a record. More than 500 deaths were attributed to an opioid overdose. In other words, a heroin overdose. Well, this year, so far, through October, there were 400 fatal overdoses in the region. And the experts are saying that we are going to surpass last year's record number. Well over 500 people are going to overdose on opioids this year alone in the St. Louis metropolitan region. The man who has been on the front lines of this, who saw this coming for years, who goes around the country speaking about it, is our very own Percy Menzies, who owns ARCA, the Assistant Recovery Centers for America. Percy, thanks for joining us here on the Big 550 KTRS. Percy, are you there? Percy, are you there? Hello, yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. All right, good. Uh, first of all, is do you agree that this, it's getting worse and, and it's not getting better? You're on the front lines. What are you seeing? Yeah, it, it is getting worse because, you know, the, 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 the biggest, the pathogen, what causes the addiction is supply. And we have no strategy in place to control the supply. That's the problem because, you know, if you want to control uh, malaria or the Zika virus, what do you do? You spray and kill the mosquitoes. Here we have no way to kill the supply of the opiate. As long as the supply is coming in, our chances of, of, of somehow overcoming the ep epidemic are virtually zero. Uh, we keep hearing uh, it's heroin, but we keep hearing pres prescription drugs, and we keep hearing fentanyl. And fentanyl is, I mean, that's a that's a... That's a prescription drug, is it not? It's a prescription drug, but it is coming illegally. What is happening is that, you know, if you see the, tr the whole uh, trail of it, it is made in China. The Chinese will sell anything to anyone. So these, uh, the drug dealers, who, people who make the heroin in Mexico, they are buying the, the fentanyl and bringing it into Mexico. They are now lacing the heroin supplies with fentanyl to make their bat stronger. They're trying to make it high octane. And they have no idea how dangerous this fentanyl is. It's 80 times stronger than morphine. So you have virtually no chance of, of doing anything against this. That is what is killing people. So you're going to see more and more. And even worse, they actually confiscated a kilogram of a super, super heavy opiate called uh, carfentanyl that is a thousand times stronger than morphine. That is called an animal tranquilizer. It's so dangerous that if a dog sniffs that vapor of fentanyl, they can kill that person, can kill the animal. We had a uh, heroin addict on who was uh, quite candid with us a couple months ago, and she was telling us that when, when the public hears, oh my goodness, there's some bad heroin out there, we all recoil and say, oh my goodness, that, that's terrible, stay away. The drug addict hears, oh my goodness, let's go find it. Do you agree with that's that? Exactly. It's exactly because it is such a narcissistic disease that if I'm spending money, I want to get the, the best high that I can get. And they are desperate to get the high. So they will be more attracted. They will see who is the one who overdosed, and they want to buy that batch of that, of that drug. That narcissistic is the, how bad the problem is. So if somebody wants to lose weight, I don't want, an, I don't want a donut. And so I have the willpower to say, I don't want a donut. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to stay away from sweets. I don't want any candy during the holiday season. Does a heroin addict have that same, I mean, is it willpower or is there something that they just can't say no to? Well, the problem is, and you know, I tell people that this is what the, I tell people, that when you, human beings were designed, were created to thrive, not to survive. Addiction throws you into a survival mode. Now, if you're in survival, in a survival mode, you don't care about anything except surviving. So a heroin addict is in a survival mode. They don't care about any consequence of how dangerous the drug is, how unsafe it is, what do I do? So this is the big danger that, you know, in a, and they are happy to be in the survival mode and we do nothing to help them get out of the survival mode. All right. That's the challenge. Let's, so there are people who've also said to me, heroin addicts, who say, I'd like to get help. It's cheaper for me to get high than it is to go into rehab. Right. Not only that, what is rehab? Can anybody tell me what rehab is? That's the problem, that, that rehab or treatment is not standardized. I can hang a shingle outside my door, say, I'm a treatment center, I'm a rehab, 
And that just makes it worse because rehab can actually be more dangerous. Some of these people go away to California, Arizona to, you know, 28-day, 30-day, 60-day rehab. They come back and within hours or days, they overdose and die. So rehab can, can potentially be dangerous. The treatment has to occur. The bulk of the treatment has to occur in the patient's natural work and home environment. You've been saying this to me for the last 15 years I've known you. You you often say that when you take somebody away from the triggers and then you put them back into that same environment, they've never been taught how to handle those triggers, and so they can't handle the uh, the triggers once they get back into that environment. That's exactly it. That's called the deprivation effect. That has been known for the last 50 years, and this is the definition of insanity. When, is, when are we going to learn about it? I mean, you know, we spent millions of dollars. The, the Surgeon General uh, just issued a report. I don't know how many millions of dollars we spent on the report. It, sh- it shed no new light. The same thing we are trying to do. We have not standardized the treatment. We are spending now, you know, we are just going to pass a billion dollars. For, it's called CARA, the Comprehensive uh, 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 Addiction Recovery Act. They're going to spend a billion dollars. I'm afraid it's going to go down a black hole. You have people that is and, and who will benefit the wrong group, the groups. The one people I can assure you will not benefit from all the money coming in are the patients because the treatment is not standardized. You are trying. To, go ahead. You've been talking about this drug, and you've been sort of uh, the the main advocate for this drug. And people don't realize that the drug now, Trexone and Vivitrol, that you've been talking about, is this now the same, virtually the same drug as they're allowing police officers to carry to 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 revive the heroin addict once they're once they overdose. Explain Narcan and what it does. No, Narcan is other. They are very different. Narcan was uh, the, was a medication developed came by the company I worked for. Narcan is a reversal agent, as an antidote. But Narcan is just that. It's like somebody had a heart attack and they are stopped. You know, giving somebody CPR, reviving them. Reviving somebody is not treatment. It, that's exactly what happened. Once you revive them, what Narcan does, it will immediately push the opiates. Uh, the the heroin out of the opiate receptor and restore breathing. But that's a very narrow window. It's only a 30-minute uh, window that you have, it's open to. You have to rush them to the hospital. We have no strategy in place. You can you know, give all the Narcan you want, but that is not going to solve the problem. Yes, it should be used, and I highly recommend that. But you have to follow that with treatment that allows them to move away from the survival mode back into what do, you, what do you do to the addict who is revived, survived, and life is saved, and they don't want to get help? What do, what do you do to that person? Well, that's what they don't want to get help because they do not want to get help because the help that we provide them is of very little attract is not attractive to them. It is not going to help them because when you are you are addicted, you are in like a you know, homeless person, just giving you, sending you to you know, giving your meal or giving your blanket to curl up near a, a steam vent is not enough. It's, it's going to take a lot more effort than that. You have to create, we have to create treatment centers where they come in there almost on a daily basis, not just giving them, if they have to take the medication, take them, let them be seen by the physicians, by the counselors, by the social workers. It is a huge challenge. Why, why are people not taking the, what you call it, accepting treatment? Because the treatment does nothing for them. It gives them no help whatsoever. That's uh, the reason. Uh, who are you seeing? Uh, Percy Menzies with us, the owner of uh, ARCA, who is a proud sponsor of the show, and I've been friends with him for years, and for years he's been saying that this epidemic was coming, and now it's finally here. Percy, who are you seeing come through your door every day? What type of client are you coming to see? Age? Everyone, everyone. Now, you know, obviously, this has become a huge problem because now a lot of the young white folks are being affected by that. And unfortunately, when this happens, all hell breaks loose. So we are seeing a lot of young people. The vast majority of the clients we see are between the ages of 18 and 30. 18 young and people. 30. Which, 18 and 30. Which, Sometimes even as, early, as young as 17, 17 and a half, but mostly it's 18 to 30. This is the most vulnerable group, 
And if we don't do anything for this group, we are going to lose a generation of a citizen. Uh, how are they getting addicted? Are they getting addicted per, through prescription drugs? Are they getting addicted from smoking marijuana? Are they getting addicted accidentally? What's, how are they getting to the point where they're ending up on your doorstep? Because there is, there is so much heroin around. Now, some of them will say, yes, I, you know, I used to use prescription drugs. Now there is no doubt about it that the, that the, the access to prescription drugs has been severely curtailed. Physicians have got the message loud and clear. So that is becoming less. Now we have two problems. We have this, uh, this very potent uh, heroin laced with fentanyl coming into the country, and there is nothing to stop it. And we are also using addicting drugs like buprenorphine as treatment. We have to use it, but that also is an opiate. So when you give them a script for, for Suboxone or for, for buprenorphine, it lands up on the street. They're selling it to buy heroin. So we have a problem. So, when, so the, the, um, the challenge here is that we have to use opiate drugs like buprenorphine and methadone to treat these people. Now, methadone doesn't leak into the, is not diverted because methadone is very tightly controlled. You have to go to the clinic every day to get it. But buprenorphine has more leeway. A physician can write for it in their uh, office. So you're saying, you're saying some of these drugs that, that they're giving have a street value? Oh, huge. Buprenorphine is called Suboxone. It has a street value of 10 to $15 a pill. So that would be joking. So, yes, the, the medications we use have street value. That's the challenge. And these drugs, so naltrexone and Vivitrol, you use, which are non-addictive, and they block the cravings, and that, along with the program, you see results. Right, because obviously, you know, opium and naltrexone and Vivitrol have no street value because they're non-opiates. But physicians are very reluctant to use them because it's a lot more work to use a non-addicting drug. You know, using an addicting drug, you know, feeding up what they call somebody on a diet, donuts, is quite easy to do that. But keeping them, you know, getting them to take a, eat a healthy uh, diet of, of salads or other things is, is not easy. But the rewards are much greater. So you have to, yes, some people may need uh, suboxone or buprenorphine, but that cannot be the only mode of treatment. That's what I'm saying for the, last, for the longest time. Look, standardize the treatment, be able to target the patient who needs it, offer them the broadest range of treatments. That doesn't, is not happening right now. Uh, uh, Percy, while we have you, you've talked to me off the air, and you said we see a spike in, in alcohol and alcohol abuse over the holiday season. Yes. Actually, you know, the alcohol consumption goes up by about 25 to 30 percent in November, December, and January. It starts around um, the end of um, the end of October, goes all the way to Super Bowl Sunday. And your program, Naltrexone and Vivitrol, also work when it comes to alcohol. Yes, they are very effective. Naltrexone and Vivitrol are very effective for to treating um, alcoholism. That's where the that's where, that's the paradox of it. That the three effective medications to treat alcoholism are all non opiates, non addicting, no street value. So that's why using medication is not controversial. Some people will oppose it. The problem with opiates is that out of the three medications approved by the FDA, two are highly abusable and divertible. That's the challenge. So with alcoholism, we are telling people that, you know, yeah, what is frustrating for us is that a lot of the people, three times more people die from alcoholism than opiate overdose. 88,000 people die a year, die from alcoholism, and about 25, 27,000 people die from um, heroin overdose. But the alcoholic patients are completely overshadowed because the, everything is opiates, opiates, opiates. And alcohol, I've been saying this for many years, is the gateway drug. We see a lot more alcohol, and that's, an, that's a very treatable illness. So my message to our listeners is that if you're of loud one or you have an alcohol problem, this is the time to give yourself the best New Year's, Christmas gift you can give yourself. Because, because you, have, you have people who uh, are on Naltrexone and Vivitrol for years and uh, are not drinking. Yes, they are, it's a very, very effective. That is a very proven treatment. It, it works exceptionally well. 
It can, uh, and the treatment can be done in a way that they, they can go back to work literally within a day or two. The vast majority, I'm talking about 90%, can go back to work within a day or two, so there is no loss of income, no loss of confidentiality, and they're getting well in the natural environment where the work can live. This is, the, this is the, mo- the modality of treatment that should be followed. Treat the disease in the natural environment. Treat mm-hmm. the condition. I'm not saying disease because this is a very is a disorder that you can regain your life and be normal without, being called, without calling it a disease and say you have to be on something for the rest of your life. Percy, uh, if you were to sp- talk to Governor-elect Greitens or President-elect Donald Trump and they said to you, you could do, we'll do whatever you tell us to do, what would you like to see society do to help solve the heroin problem? First, um, obviously, we need to standardize the treatment. This is, we have too many silos. I would love to be the, you know, the, the, the what do you call it, the, the, the demolition charge of, de, of breaking all the silos. We have so, each of the, the treatment industrial complex is a major thing. People who, the methadone clinics only use methadone. The physicians are trained to use uh, buprenorphine. They only treat, uh, use buprenorphine. I would like to ask Pre- President uh, Trump, as an emergency, to lift the restrictions on the buprenorphine limits. Right now, there are very strict limits. As an emergency, restrict those limits on, uh, you know, on buprenorphine because we need that as a detox agent. Physicians should be trained how to use other drugs like naltrexone you know, and Vivitrol and create an environment where we can also, just like as we provide, if we provide uh, cash incentives, provide cash incentives to get people well, because we are not going to get people well by just giving them a pill. It is not going to work. You said something interesting, the rehab industrial complex. It is a huge, huge impediment. I mean, this, the, the, Rehab, reindustrial, uh, rehab treatment industrial, rehab industrial complex. The, the the silos are getting taller and thicker. I mean, how in the world can you ex- can you ex- can you justify that somebody goes to California, pays fifty thousand or sixty thousand dollars for one month of rehab? What is that rehab? And then they're coming back, relapsing. Insurance companies are paying for some of those treatments. There is no satisfaction. The other treatment that is driven by insurance companies is called IOP, intensive outpatient. It is dropped, you know, usually it lasts for six weeks. Tell me that you expect somebody to get well within six weeks' time, and when we offer them medication like buprenorphine, they just want this medication. They are not interested in counseling. They are not interested in anything else. We have to say, you know, I would love, love to meet with them and say, you are, you are now um, earmarking $1 billion for treatment before it ends up in a black hole. Please listen to people like me. I may be a crazy Indian. I'm still crazy, but at least that I've got a message that I can uh, that makes sense. And so, and so, so, so you're, saying, you're, you're saying for a fraction of the cost, you're doing and people like you are doing much better in terms of results than these $50,000 month-long stays on the beach in, in San Diego. Absolutely. I mean, you can, you know, I treat 400 heroin addicts a month, plus I treat about 100, 150 people with alcoholism. That's a staggering number for a relatively small clinic like mine. Why can't we, you know, if I had more resources, I had more support, we could, we could literally revolu- revolutionize the treatment. You know, come up with a, with a creative way. Mm-hmm. And I wish, you know, somebody's listening. They say, hey, what, you know, I want to listen to this guy and say this word. 400 heroin addicts a month. That's a staggering number. It really is. Percy Menzies, you're the best. I value your friendship. Thank you for your time. Merry Thanks. Christmas to you and the family, and I'll see you soon. Okay. Thanks a lot. Good luck. Bye-bye. You got it. Percy Menzies tr- talks all around the country uh, about heroin and heroin addiction and uh, has a message one that is quite important. 938, Big 550, KTRS. I got a guy. You're looking for some.